baptism. If you remember that, we talked about, uh, remember the graveyard and the, the later the sanctuary, the candle lighting that they did and some of those other things? Some of you that are familiar with Roman Catholicism, you, you'll, you'll find some of these things familiar to you. You'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's where it came from. Yeah, that's where it came from was back then. That's where they got the worship of the Eucharist, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, I'm not going to expound on that a, a ton, but in that sense, I, I probably won't. But uh, we're, I'm going to read to you a contender of the faith, Vigilantius. Sounds like vigilante, right? But uh, Vigilantius and uh, just how he conducted himself uh, during this time period. And he wrote about a lot of these things. And he would, he would be, he was a, you know, you could call him an Anabaptist. Bible believer, you can call whatever you want to call him, that's who he was. And at this time, he's going to talk about some of the errors that that had arisen at the, that risen up at that time and that he had a problem with. Okay. So these are uh, vigilantius would be like a fifth century hero of the faith, I would say. And he went against the the Roman Catholic hierarchy and the things that were going on at the time. Um and, and you might guess that he was absolutely hated for it. Uh, you might guess that a lot of people didn't like him, including mainstream Roman Catholicism or mainstream Christians, and I use that term loosely, kind of like the evangelical crowd today, that they didn't like him. Okay, so they weren't real fond of, of him, and Jerome was their hero, St. Jerome, and he kind of, they called him St. Jerome, but he kind of... Uh, didn't didn't like him because uh, Vigilantius he reproved him for the errors that were coming in and Jerome and Jerome was the producer I believe of wasn't it the Latin Vulgate was that Jerome's Latin Vulgate isn't that right Jacob uh, and that was that was the false Bible perversion that was that that would arise and of course you have men like Vigilantius that would not agree with that that would be it stand in opposition to those things as the true church would stand for the true scriptures down through the ages that would happen you will always trace wherever you find the Lord's churches you find God's word. Wherever you find God's word in its true form, then what do you find? You find the Lord's churches. His word and his churches always together. Why is that? Well, because we are people of the book. If we are not, then we go along with the mainstream of today. Vigilantius was born in Aquitaine, as it is proved by DeMarca, in a, in a dissertation of which is not yet published. So that's where he was born, and he's going to meet up with uh, Jerome. He's going to be, uh, he, in the year 394, uh, he meets up with Jerome, uh, and Jerome receives him with all affection possible, it says. He made no long stay in the Holy Land. It is probable that his disputes about originism, which troubled the province, obliged him to return the sooner. St. Jerome seems to insinuate that Vigilantius had been gained by Rufinus, an enemy of St. Jerome. So what happened here? Vigilantius meets with Jerome and he's like, hey, you're just a little bit too much like Origen for me. You, you like Origen's writings too much. Remember Origen? He was the chief heretic of like the third century. Uh, he was the guy that taught all the perversions. He was the guy that allegorized the scriptures. He was the guy that, guy that taught perversions of Bible truth and all those other things, right? He was that weirdo, and, and, and uh, Jerome kind of sided with him, right? Well, this was the true cause of the hate and rage that Jerome eventually had against Vigilantius, whereof we have a very sensible interest. And he talks about that in, the, in, the, in his 75th epistle. He speaks against Vigilantius. So what are the kinds of things that Vigilantius uh, would stand up for? Now, uh, uh, we'll get into that. We'll explain what he says. But you'll find that there were always men that would earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. There was always men and women that would rise up, that would rise up and they would not... They wouldn't just give in to the norm. It's like this church. We do not follow mainstream evangelicalism in America. We do not follow what, they, what is commonly called Christianity in America's churches today, right? We don't, we don't agree with them. We don't walk, lock, and step with them. We're not, we're not going to be in agreement with them. 
and neither were they. The writers of the Church of Rome have not been wanting to long since to draw their advantage from these invectives of St. Jerome against the Protestants and never speak of Vigilantius but as a heretic. So they just call him a heretic right away. And you're going to find out why they accused him of being a heretic. They always accuse Anabaptists and those others of being heretics. Always. They always accuse him of that. Why? Well, Rome did it so they could burn you. If a Baptist calls you a heretic, it's because your doctrine is wrong. If Rome does it, it's because he wants to kill you. They want to kill you. That's just what they want to do. And if Calvin did it and the Reformers did it, it's too because they wanted to burn you. They wanted to get rid of you. They wanted to get you out of there. Ulrich Zwingli wanted to drown you. That's why. Baptists didn't. When we say heretic, we mean because after first and second admonition, you don't follow the scriptures or, you, or you're a damnable heretic and damnable heresy that is leading people to hell. That's the difference, right? Not just a dif difference of agreement or anything like that, but Bible doctrine. The Bishop of Mew hath carefully traced their steps. He tells us, therefore, after his manner, very confidently, that even in the fourth century, the most clear sight of all the rest, there was found but one only, Vigilantius, who opposed himself against the honors given to the saints. Listen to what he fought. He, and remember, we talked about these heresies, right? The honors given against the honors, uh, opposed himself against the honors given to the saints, right? What that honors means that they were praying to them, right? They would, they would have special feast days. And they would pray to them and stuff like that. And Vigilantius says, nope, not doing it, right? And the worshiping of their relics. So they would say like they had Peter's toe, right? Or they had, or they had a statue or they had a special relic and they would, they would worship or venerate those relics. And of course, men like Vigilantius would be like, nope. Just like you would be. If somebody had a statue in here and told you, well, you have to pray to this statue. I mean, you have to, you have to venerate this statue. Right? A fancy way of saying you're going to worship it, right? The worship of relics, which got its... Uh, it happened in the, in the, at the end of the 4th century, 5th century, 6th century is when all that relic worship came in, right? So, you know, uh, remember, remember back in the, remember Constantine, when he came on the scene, his mother was in, involved in gathering artifacts from all over the Holy Land and bringing them back and mystifying them and worshiping those relics, right? What happened, th there's a story similar to that in the scriptures in the Old Testament, Right? about Gideon. What did Gideon do? Do you remember what Gideon did? He made an ephod. And what happened with that ephod? Do you remember what happened with it? It says, it says all of Israel went a whoring after it. They venerated it. They venerated it. They worshiped it. Right? Remember that? It says Gideon. It says, and then Gideon, didn't mean anything by it. He, he wasn't doing it, but he started a tradition that led into a, what? A whoring after other gods. Moses' rod, or Moses' uh, serpent on the pole, right? What did they end up doing with that? Same thing. They, they venerated it, right? They, they, they worshipped it. They worshipped the relics. Anyway, so uh, he stood against there, and this is why he was a heretic, because he didn't agree with that. See how the witch is twisted around? You're the heretic because you don't believe in, in worshiping the relics. You don't believe in venerating those, those saints. You don't believe in doing all those other things, so you're the actual heretic, right? That's what they did. Yet he is looked upon by the Protestants as a person who has preserved the despotium, that is to say the secession of the apostolic doctrine is preferred to them, preferred by them to St. Jerome, who hath the whole church for him. So in other words, what he was saying is later on, the Protestants and others agreed with Vigilantius and followed him because he wasn't worshiping relics and doing all that. So they, and Jerome, the whole Roman Catholic church was for him, you know, the, the, everybody was, they, they were okay with him. Okay, he says, this is of necessity obligeth us to make a particular view of the opinions of Vigilantius. Now, by the way, this is from the history of the, of the Albigenses by Alex, A-L-L-I-X. He wrote the history of the Waldenses and the, the Albigenses. And he's going back into the, the, the 5th century, the, the end of the 4th century, beginning of the 5th century, to bring some of this out. So that's where that resource comes from, okay? 
And he says, this of a necessity obliges us to take a particular view of his opinions. I shall not make a stop to invalidate what the bishop says that Vigilantius wrote in the fourth century, nor at his endeavor to cloak the notion of his church concerning the religious worship they gave to saints and to relics under the indeterminate expression of the honors of the saints and the worship of relics. But to come to the thing itself, I maintain that if Vigilantius had the misfortune of falling under the displeasure of St. Jerome by the censure he pronounced against the popular superstition of rendering various honors to the relics of saints, yet was he never condemned by the church that then was, nor treated as a heretic. No one ever treated him as a heretic and said he was wrong for it because they knew that he was right in what he said, right? So anyway, uh, he wrote, uh, many people wrote about him and slandered him. You know, we won't get into that too much because it won't really matter a whole lot. Because um, that's what they do to people that believe the truth. Uh, but anyway, Jerome was not happy about that. Uh, part of the problem uh, with that was found on one of the things that, that Vigilante has fought against is found in page 31 of of, the, of uh, Vigilantius's writings or whatever, these writings, and it was against the uh, celibacy of the clergy. Vigilantius, uh, he, he wrote against that. He said, no, that's wrong. Uh, there's other things, that he, obviously, that he wrote against. St. Jerome owns in his 53rd epistle, which he writes that Vigilantius had writ twice against the worship of relics and that he called that those that adored them idolaters. So Vigilantius looks at them and says, you're a bunch of idolaters. You're lifting up these relics. That's exactly what you are. These are idols to you. These are idols to you, and you need to put them away. He says, who did honor the bones of dead men, for which St. Jerome calls him a Samaritan and a Jew, because he counted dead bodies to be unclean, as if Christians still lived under the law. So they always try to twist it. And that's what, that's what Jerome did. Jerome tried to say, well, you're calling that body unclean, so therefore, you know, you're trying to say that we're still under the law and blah, blah, That's not what he was saying at all. What Vigilantes was saying is it's wrong for you to venerate these bodies. It's wrong for you to venerate these relics. It's wrong for you to worship bones. Right? Whereas Vigilantes blamed the custom of honoring them in the churches because it was a piece of superstition in a place dedicated to religious worship, to bestow any veneration upon creatures, though the most holy and most excellent that might be. St. Jerome is forced to prevaricate upon this charge. His way of defending this matter is such as would never please the palate of Rome. See, he goes on, he says, here's what St. Jerome tried to defend himself uh, against Vigilantius' claim that you worship bones. And here was his defense. He said, but we neither worship nor adore. I do not say the relics of martyrs, but not so much as the sun and moon, etc., nor any name that is named in this world or in that which is to come, lest we should serve the creature rather than God who is blessed forever. But we honor the relics of the martyrs in worshiping him whose they are. We honor the servants that their honor may re redound to the Lord, who saith he that receives you receives me. What? Are the relics then of Peter and Paul unclean? See how they twist it? This is witchcraft. Is the body of Moses unclean, which according to the Hebrew truth was buried by the Lord himself? And as often as we enter the churches of the apostles, the prophets, and the martyrs, do we worship, do we worship the temples of idols? And shall we say that the tapers, the tap tapers which burn before the monuments are the marks of idolatry? Well, yeah, you should say that. See, see how he twisted it? And they just went about, and, and Vigilantius was the bad guy, right? Why was he the bad guy? Because he, he basically told him the truth, right? However, he says this, the Bishop of Muse says this one thing, that the, the Vigilantius was the only man that opposed the honors of the saints and the worships of relics, and that St. Jerome had the whole church on his side in his answer. Now that's not true because there were many people that were against that, right? But he was angry about it. He says here, the falsity of the first will appear to everyone that can read. St. Jerome's book against Vigilantius, St. Jerome himself witnesseth that the holy bishop in whose diocese Vigilantius was a priest, that is to say, the bishop of Barcelona was of Vigilantius' opinion, so that we have already discovered that. So there was more people that were around him that agreed with him that that was all false worship, 
right? It was all false worship. It was all pagan worship. So he tried to make excuses for his false worship, right? What a fine application does St. Jerome, says this man, make here of this passage. He that receives you receives me. And how solid an answer does he return to a solid objection, which he tells us, we honor the servants in worshiping him whose they are. You see how he twists it? So in other words, Catholic, Greek, Orthodox, and all those people, what they do is they teach all those people that you're really worshiping God when you venerate these. Like I saw that bish, that, that funny, um, I, let me, let me. <laughs> I saw that priest, that Orthodox priest, over at the community. We were over at the senior center, and he had this picture. Remember that? He had this picture of Mark. Uh, it was supposed to be Mark. I don't know how you know what Mark looks like. I don't even know what he looks like. I don't know if anybody knows what he looks like. But he had this picture of Mark, right? And he walks in, and he, he does this little thing, and he kisses the picture. And I'm like, what is that? Like, what is that all about? Like, why are you kissing that picture? He's greeting him with that. Well, the holy kiss, yeah. That's what he was doing. Right? But they teach them that that's worship to Christ. Now, what is the, thou shalt have no other gods before me. One, uh, what a consequence is this? Is there any other due to relics besides that of being interred? Was not this the custom used to the Christians of old before time of Constantinus? It is well enough seen that the good father skips over the difficulty and under a general protestation of worshiping nothing but God, he endeavors to shelter a custom which had been introduced after the emperor Constantinus' time. That is to say, about 60 years after. Vigilantius blamed the custom which but a little before had been introduced of lighting tappers before the tombs of martyrs and passing the night by them in prayer, wherein he followed the maximums of the Council of Elvira held under the empire of Constantine about 90 years before. After what manner does St. Jerome refute these complaints of Vigilantius? He tells us of the presence of the angels at the grave of Jesus Christ. These arguments, I, like I said, these people that follow Origen Augustine have the dumbest arguments I've ever heard in my life. Well, yeah, you know, there were angels outside of Jesus' grave. Oh, that explains why you're kissing a stupid picture. Duh, what was I thinking? One plus one equals five, yeah. Right? That's how, that's how dumb it is. The answer is so ridiculous. Right. But you know what? When people have the power to burn you, they don't care if they have right answers. They'll just kill you. Exactly. Just nope. kill you. They don't care. Yeah. They don't care if their answer is right. We can kill you. So nan and a boo-boo. Right? That's how, that's how they treat you. Right. It's like, we don't care. We'll just kill you. We don't have to have a right answer. We'll just kill you. Anyway, that's how Constantine did things too, by the way. Uh, here he says here, he, he tells us of the presence of the angels at the grave of Jesus. He relies upon the example of the apostles who buried the body of Stephan. He produced the custom of Daniel and the apostles who spent the night in prayer. And all this without a doubt extremely to the purpose. And the Protestants are much in the wrong to prefer the opinions of Vigilantius to such solid reasonings as these. Now he's being facetious and he's making fun of it. But that's Alex says when he's saying this. But that's, but that's what he's saying. All right, he's it like, wait a minute, like, okay, so because Daniel prayed all night and because we had a funeral for Stefan, <laughs> that means you're supposed to be worshiping. Oh, okay. Do you see how they put that together? And it's like, but that's Roman Catholicism. That's, that's what they do. Like, it doesn't make sense. And the Bible has nothing to do with what they do. It just gets in their way sometimes, right? <laughs> But it may be replied that St. Jerome disputed only slightly and for argument's sake in his epistle to Reparius, not having then seen the writing of Vigilantius and therefore handled the matter only as a disclaimer. This indeed is the best excuse that can be alleged to make the reader digest the furious transports and in, in invectives of this famous monk who treats Vigilantius no otherwise than as another Julian the Apostate and seems very willing to have him, had him destroyed by the law mentioned in the 13th of Deuteronomy. And after all this, St. Jerome is the same in his book against Vigilantius, which follows us. So he wanted to have Vigilantius killed, according to Deuteronomy 13, saying he was a false prophet because he didn't want, him to, he didn't want to worship relics. Catching that? It's more like Revelation 13. Right. 
After a preface which outdoes all the monsters that either the scriptures or fables speak of, he begins thus. He says this, Here is suddenly started up one vigilantius, or rather dormititanius, who with an unclean spirit fights against the spirit of Christ and denies that any veneration ought to be given to the sepulchres of the martyrs, condemns the watchings at them, affirms that alleluias ought to be sung at no time except Easter, calls continence heresy... What is he talking about there when he says that? Calls continence heresy. Jacob, what's he talking about? He's talking about celibacy. See, he's not talking about uh, controlling your lustful desires if you're not married or whatever. What he's, try what he's saying is, is that they're, what they're doing, what Rome is doing is forbidding to marry. Right? That, so, so he's twisting what Vigilantius was saying. He's saying, no, those priests should be married. Those, those bishops should be married. Right? And chastity, the nursery of the nursery of lust. He's accusing vigilantius of believing that, that being chaste is the is the uh, nursery of lust. That's not what vigilantius was saying. What he was saying was if you follow celibacy, those priests are gonna get in trouble. Cause they have to have a way, because every man was made, most men were made to be with a wife. That's how God made them. It's not good for a man to be alone. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 7 explains that let every man have his own wife and let every wife have her own husband, right? That's what Vigilantius' argument was against forced celibacy, right? And so that as Euphorbus was said to be born again in Pythagoras, in like manner it seems to be revived Jovinius' wickedness, in whom as we were forced to oppose ourselves against the wiles of the devil, so likewise are we now equally obliged to oppose this man's errors. So what he's saying, he's saying Vigilantius is in the air and he's a devil. Vigilantius has got devils because he doesn't believe in celibacy. He doesn't believe in veneration of, of uh, relics. He doesn't believe in worshiping at the martyr's tombs. He doesn't believe in any of these things, which, by the way, none of these things are found in the scriptures to do except in the things that are cursed, right? That's, that's what they're found. That's, that's where they're found at, right? But that doesn't matter to them uh, because that's how Rome operates, right? All right, what Caesarean eloquence is this? He says, what a strange account of these things. Okay, so surely the good Saint Jerome did not think of what he said. So extremely was he transported with an inconsiderate zeal for celibacy. But however, this zeal of his had a reasonable motive, he says. This is the first heresy of Vigilantius. He would have it allowed to ministers to marry. So that's his heresy. Whereas in the 10 provinces subject to the Pope, in the 17th provinces of the jurisdiction of Ephesus, and in the five provinces of Egypt, they followed a contrary custom. See, he just wasn't for celibacy, so he's a heretic, right? This, without a doubt, was a, was a crying heresy, and yet it appears from the decretal of Pope to Hymerius, the bishop of Terracona, that it had been made so little impression upon the minds of men that Innocent I was fain to write in AD 405, the bishop of Toulouse, upon the same subject of celibacy. So much opposition to that business everywhere meet with. So people rebelled against it. At the time when celibacy first came out, the bishops around, the, they, they fought against it. They were like, no way. What do you mean we can't get married? You know, what do you mean? Where, where do you find that at? And that's exactly what... Uh, he was fighting. Say, uh, anyway, so St. Jerome tells us first that he had received Vigilantius' book by the care of two men, and he was really upset about it. Okay, so anyway, uh, let's see. Let's move right along here. Uh, oh, here's what he says. Uh, let's see. He says that Vigilantius had infected with his opinions and that he had been informed by them that there were some who, there who favored his vices and were pleased with his blasphemies after having branded his book for a stupid piece of ignorance and which did not deserve to be discussed were it not for the sake of some silly women laden with sins of whom St. Paul speaks of. And he assaults Vigilantius upon the account of the place of his birth. So he, they're at Halmanim attacks. They're not, he's not dealing with the actual text of what happened or, or the actual question of celibacy or veneration of idols or any of those other things. He indeed saith he every way answers his extraction for being descended from robbers and as a mixed rabble drawn together from several parts. From Pompeii after he had conquered Spain and hasting to his triumph removed from the tops of the Pyrenean hills. So he's explaining that 
you know, that guy's from a really bad place, so he must not be right. So then here is a violent transport of his rage. What horrid thing it is that this robber hath attempted. He says why he said, he said, what need is there for thee not only to venerate, but also adore something, I know not what, which thou worshipest, carrying it about in a little box? He said, you worship something that you can carry around in a little box. You, right? Think about that. Your God, the cookie God, right? That, that's a chick track, right? The cookie God. But think about that. The Eucharist, they worship something that they can carry around in a box. This is... That they have control over, right. And again, in the same book, why dost thou kiss by way of worship a little dust wrapped in linen? And afterwards, we have almost seen a heathenish rite introduced into the churches. Whole heaps of wax tapers lighted in the face of the sun and men everywhere kissing a little dust shut up in a small box with religious reverence, which is wrapped about with fine linen. These men must needs render a great honor to the most blessed martyrs whom they suppose to stand in need of illustration of vile candles, whereas the lamb that is in the midst of the throne doth illuminate them, but with all brightness of his majesty. So Jerome didn't like that, obviously. You see how he came out very forcefully, vigilantius did, against these errors. You got to understand that, that Rome was taking such control of everything, and 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 all these heresies were crept in so much that they they had filled everywhere. Right, he said that as if Vigilantius therein had spoke blasphemy, and der and derogated from the honor due to the martyrs. He defends his judgment by the example of Constantine, right? Because here's what happened. He proves that it may not be done by the example of Paul and Barnabas and St. Paul. The Church of Rome and the Bishop of Mu are concerned to inquire whether St. Jerome was very orthodox in denying a thing which is present cannot be so absolutely denied without the imputation of heresy. That made him mad, right? So he defends his judgment by the examples of Constantine. Oh, that is to say of Constantinus, who had transported to Constantinople the relics of St. Andrew, St. Luke, and Timothy. Like, how'd they know they were his? Like, how do you even know? And why does it even matter? And the emperor Arc Arcadius, who had caused the bones of the prophet Samuel to be brought out of Judea to Thrace with the appro approbation of the bishops and the people of that, that time. This is a very solid defense, if we may believe St. Jerome, for it seems there is no more to be said when once a superstition comes to be 60 years old. So he's making fun of him. He say, why? Because Constantine did it, so you can do it? So what Vigilantius is trying to prove is none of this is in the scriptures. None of this has a scriptural mandate. But all these heresies, what you're hearing from, you're hearing notes of someone, you're hearing the, the history of someone who actually was fighting these things as they came up. Imagine yourself being in that time and going against that when everybody, when, every, when, it, when all the heathenish rites are being popularized. They are becoming popular and you're standing in the gap against them. And you have to stand against what they're doing. And everybody around you, and many people around you, don't like it. That's what happened. So, but the pleasant thing of all is that St. Jerome goes about to support his popular worship by this way of arguing. Here's how he, he argued his worship of relics. Thou supposest him to be dead, and therefore thou blasphemest. Read the gospel. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. But if they be alive, say you, they ought not to be shut up in some narrow prisons. And you own that the souls of the apostles and martyrs have taken up their abode either in the bosom of Abraham or in the place of refreshment or under the altar of God. And they cannot be present at their tombs or wherever they please. Now, what, what happened here? He's talking about that they, they believed they were teaching that spirits roam, that, that the spirits of the martyrs and other people roam the earth. And that's what Jerome was trying to say. Right. They were treating, teaching some whacked out stuff, some demonic stuff. Right? For by your account, they are persons of the first quality and so ought not to be shut up amongst murderers in a filthy dungeon, but to enjoy a free and honorable custody in the fortunate islands and the Elysian, Elysian fields. 
Legion fields. Thus you limit and set laws to God and bind the apostles in chains and keep them in custody till the day of judgment. So that they cannot be with their Lord, of whom it is written that they followed the Lamb whithersoever he goes. Now seeing the Lamb is everywhere, they who are with the Lamb must be supposed to be everywhere also. And when the devil and spirits do wander throughout the whole world, and by their over great nimbleness are present everywhere, shall we say that the martyrs, after the shedding of their blood, are shut up in their coffins without being able to stir from thence? He's teaching necromancy. Teach him in the worship of spirits. That's how he defended his worship of relics. Well, we don't doubt that there's spirits behind what you're doing, just not the people. They're called familiar spirits. See, this is what God, see, what he accused vigilantius of doing is what he was doing. They were venerating spirits of martyrs and other things. They were the real witches, but they were accusing. Vigilantius of being one because he denied any any forbid any of his people to do any of that right what a terrible defense of such of such foolishness and, and idolatry these fine reasonings of saint jerome and by the way he's being when he says that he's joking the, the writer is he's saying these fine reasonings of saint jerome against vigilantius have two characters the first is that they are contrary to the sentiments of most of any of the ancients. The second is that they have been despised by, other, by St. Austin, he says, and in fine have displeased all of the schoolmen. So any of those people that study the Bible, he's saying, they, they knew that this was like garbage. You say in your book that whilst we are alive, we may mutually pray for one another, but that after we are once dead, no man's prayers can be heard for another. And the rather because even the martyrs themselves begging of God that he would avenge their blood have not been able to obtain their request. So he's saying you should pray for the dead. This is where that heresy came in. Imagine standing around like you're looking like, why are these people doing this? He saith, what, what is St. Jerome's answer to this? He saith that if the saints when alive procured favors for others, they may obtain them much rather now when they are with Christ, seeing they are not dead but asleep as the scriptures tell us. So he's saying, well, you know, now that they're dead, they can get, you know, they can, they can get their prayers answered so now because they're with God or whatever. Heresy, right? That is heresy. That is, it's wicked is what it is. So Jerome says, neither do we light wax tapers at noonday as you causelessly complain, but only to ally the darkness, the night with the help of candles and to be kept walking by the light of them, lest being in darkness, we should fall asleep as well as you. <laughs> but and if some out of ignorance and simplicity amongst the laymen or devout women of whom we may truly say that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge should do this in honor to the martyrs, what is the loss or hurt of all this? Like, what's wrong with idolatry? So the apostles also murmured of old that the women made waste of her ointment, but were reproved by our Lord himself. Neither did the Lord want the ointment any more than the martyrs stand in need of wax tapers. And yet because the woman did it in honor to Christ, her devotion is accepted. And so they who light wax tapers receive a reward according to their faith. But the apostle tells us, let everyone abound in his own sense. Well, no, the apostles don't say that. Is that some twisted garbage or what? He just abuses that. Vigilantius calls them idolaters who by lighting wax tapers by daylight did imitate the customs of the heathens. Jeremiah 10, learn not the way of the heathen. By the way, turn there because that's not just, Jeremiah 10 is not just for, we, we use it for Christmas and other things like that, but it, it isn't just for that. It's that worship of the heathen. Verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. What do you think that sounds like, what they're doing here? Vain. It's vanity. And it's heathen. It's all heathen stuff. Right? That's what it is. It's all heathen. Heathen. 
How does St. Jerome answer him? First, he tells him that what was done of this kind of idols was detestable, but that the same thing when done out of respect to the martyrs is very commendable. So if you venerate saints, those that are dead, if you venerate them, well, you're, you're holy and good. But if you do that to a bad person, then you're bad. See? See the difference? You can worship the one because they're, they were a good person. You can worship the other because you can't worship the other because they were bad. Well, no, you can't worship either one of them. And you can't make that vain heathenish tradition part of anything that you do because it's all against God's word, right? It's all heathen. It's all not worship according to spirit and in truth. It's all blasphemy, right? That the Eastern churches lighted candles at the reading of the gospel, though there be no relics of the martyrs. Thirdly, that Jesus Christ assigns to the wise virgin lamps lighted. Well, there you go. So because Jesus had talked about lamps lighted in the Bible, you can light candles to the dead. I mean, don't you see how that works? I mean, don't you see how that works? Right? I mean, <laughs> that's some good argumentation right there, isn't it? That is excellent. Well, okay, so there's a parable about... Uh, them uh, about the virgins having lamps that were lit. So then if you light candles to the dead, well, you're doing the same thing. So see, it's okay for you to do it. If they're good people. If they're good people. See? Yeah. Right? Because Christ said it's good to have your lamp lit. It sounds so simple that you think, how could they fall for it? But people fall for dumber things today. That's right. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thirdly, that Jesus Christ assigns the wise virgin's lamp light. And fourthly, he opposeth to, to Vigilantius the example of the Bishop of Rome, who celebrated the Mass upon the tombs of the apostles as upon an altar. I feared I should tire the patience of my readers should I go about to examine this piece of St. Jerome's throughout. This specimen may suffice to judge of the whole work. He's like, I don't want to kill you with this. It's terrible. Um, it'll just make you sick. Okay, let's see here. Vigilantius opposed himself. Let me see. Where is my... What did I do with that backpack? I want to look up some specific references for you quickly, and then we'll be done here in this book. And I have them here. Some of the, some of the heresies that were there at the time. Uh, let's see. Whoa. Page 31. Let's see. Uh, he talks about um, the first heresy of vigilantes. Well, we talked about that, allowing ministers to marry. That was, that was where he called him a heretic. Uh, let's see, another one, 35. 35 to 36. Okay, we talked about that one too. Thou supposed to be dead, and therefore thou blasphemous. So, so he's talking about the worship of, of the dead, right? The belief in the unleashed spirits from the dead. That's what they believe. That's a very serious heresy, right? Because all they are is familiar spirits, like, like the, the witch of Endor that, that raised up the familiar spirit, right? That's all they are, okay? So we have to be careful about that. Uh, let's see, page uh, 55 there, 31, 35, 30. Yep. Um, so the, anyway, so these are some of this... Um, Let's see, it's false. Jerome maintains the church prayed to saints. Right. Uh, Jerome maintains that the church prayed. It is false that St. Jerome maintains that the church prayed to saints, whereof Vigilantius accuseth those against him whom he had writ. He agrees with Vigilantius that the saints ought not to be prayed to, even as friends to Christ, intercessors with God. It is not manifest. Anyway, so he says that there. Uh, they had their argument there. Uh, let's see. To speak the truth, the whole of Vigilantius' crime consists first in that he was willing to bring the discipline of the Council of Elvira in force again. So he was trying to bring those pre-Constantinian type 
heresies that had came before that. He was trying to bring that council back into, into session, which was assembled at the beginning of the fourth century. The constitutions were, were undervalued towards the end of the same age after the Christian religion began to bear down all its opposers under the reign of Constantine and his children. Secondly, because he attributes to the church some customs which were not all of them authorized, though they were already generally received and maintained by the ignorant and superstitious sort of people. That's all this stuff is, is ignorant superstitions. You look at Roman Catholicism, Mystery, Babylon the Great, it is all stupid superstitions. It has nothing to do with the Bible at all. And, and their Protestant children do the same thing. Thirdly, because he opposed some of those customs as general, which were capable of being examined in a tolerable sense. Right? Thus it is evident that the Protestants may look upon Vigilantius as a zealous defender of the Christian purity and one of those who opposed themselves against superstition. So when that superstition arose, he opposed it. He stood against it. Now, what else happened at this time? We'll kind of finish up with some of these here and we'll be done. But what, what else happened uh, with that? Uh, prayers to the saints, we talked about that. The rise of monasticism because the state of spirituality was so low, sincere people gravitated toward the monasteries. This is where they started. We're going to talk about that maybe next week a little bit. They started gravitating towards that monastery concept. Why? Because the world was wicked. Who else does that? Well, in my opinion, the Amish do that, and a lot of those groups do that. They leave society altogether. They check out of, of society, and they don't influence society anymore. You think that the Amish and the Mennonites and those that aren't evangelizing and, and being out and being lights to the world, how are they? They shut up their light. They're away from them. They, they don't go out into the world and preach the gospel. They're not a light to the world right? That's where Baptists are different. That's where the Anabaptists were different. They were a light to the world. They continue to be a light to the world. You can't just leave the world and go to hell. You got to go out there and preach the gospel to them. You got to go out there and, and be in the world, but not of the world. We don't have to follow the world and everything that it does, but we can be a light. We can be, uh, and we're to be a light. We're to be the salt of the earth. How can you be the, how can you preserve society if you have nothing to do with it ever? Right? Right? God's called us to, to be a part of, uh, of that. Um, observance of Lent, a forced fast. We are to know that as long as the perfection of the primitive church remained un unattained, there was no such ob observation of Lent. Cassian, the pastor from the 5th century and a convert of John Chrysostom, said that, and that's in Alex's book here, uh, verse, uh, page 55. Prohibition of marriage for the pastor and the priest. This practice was led to much abuse and filthy behavior on the part of the priest. The influence of this unscriptural practice are still felt today. And that's what he talked about. Vigilante has talked about how perverted they were. The fact that they turned them into a bunch of, that that doctrine turned men into a bunch of perverts, right? Uh, and, and that made them mad. Then he said, that's why he said that he spoke ill of chastity. No, what he's saying is you, they're not chaste. They're wicked. And they're fulfilling their desires in other ways because you're forbidding them to marry. You don't just, if, if, if you have those desires and they never leave and they never go, they have to be, they have to be fulfilled one or two ways. Or they will be, excuse me. Didn't Paul say that, or that was a choice? Yes. Somebody did it not forced. Jesus said not all men can receive that commandment. Yeah. 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 That's what Jesus no. said. Paul said that in the meantime, at the time of the persecution, when that was written, that it would be better if they were to be alone because they're going to watch their spouse die. Right? But... He wasn't, but there was no forbidding of marriage because he said, let every man have his own wife and every wife have her own husband. So you have to look at the context of it. But yes, is buried to it, it is better to marry than to burn. Bed. Yes, it was voluntary. That's right. But bishops are commanded to be married. It says they're commanded to be the husband of one wife. So they have to be married. You know, um, prohibition of marriage. Okay, prayers for the dead borrowed from pagan practices. Transubstantiation, a belief that the bread and the, and, the, and the juice of the Lord's Supper become the actual body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. It's a cannibalistic practice directly from heathen and satanic rituals, right? Purgatory, we talked about that, remember? Uh, we, we talked about that. Uh, the necessity of intent. In order for the sacraments to, be, to effectively to convey grace, the priest must be holy and sincere. They believed in that. That was the means of grace to give grace to others, and the priests had to be holy and sincere. Bible reading forbidden in the 6th century. Only the clergy should read the scriptures. Only the church can interpret the scriptures. 
So then you're not a believer priest, right? You just, you, you just, you're not allowed to interpret the Bible. You have to have somebody else interpret it for you. This is how you maintain control over people when you do that, right? That's how they did that. Um, and then auricular confession, uh, the practice of confessing sin to your priest or confessor comes directly from the pagan Romanish practices of controlling the people. If I know your secrets, I can control you. It violates, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, right? But that's what they do. They, they get them to confess their sins. They did it to kings. They brought kingdoms down. Uh, through that. They, they, the kings were so superstitious that, that they would bring kingdoms down uh, through that, right? So anyway, we'll talk about some of these other ones. But Vigilantius was one that was a brave voice, right? That stood up and, and withstood the christening, uh, the initiation of the Christian religion by baptism, uh, the sacraments, and all those other things. So uh, some men, uh, Vigilantius, he was a pastor of Barcelona, wrote against Jerome about the year 400, was suspicious of Jerome's acceptance of Origen's writings. Vigilantius desired to bring into force the forgotten Council of Elvira, which was convened around the year 300. He fought Jerome's worshipful attitude toward relics. So that, that's a summary of, of who he was and what he did and how he stood against those things. There have always been men and, and that will stand up against the tide. Of those of those teachings. Yes. False gods. Mm-hmm. No, they have no fellowship with God. Right. They replace God. Yep, they trick and they, they, they replace God with their false gods. And then that you're not, there's no mediator there, right? They're the mediator. The church is the final, uh, gives the final answer as far as what the scriptures mean instead of the Bible being, or the final answer of, of faith and practice is the church and not the scriptures. See, that's the difference. If you replace everything that Rome believes about the church and you replace that with the authority of the scriptures, you, you would almost come to being a Baptist. You see what I mean? They just have the church being the final authority. When the final authority is God's word. That's the final authority. That's the one, that's, that's the, that settles everything. Not you and I, not our opinions, not our feelings, right. not the pastor, not the bishop, not the board, not any, it's the Bible. It's the, this King James Bible, specifically, this Bible settles it, right? That settles what we believe and what we practice and what our faith is. This book determines all those matters, not the church, right? That's the difference. That's what strengthens the church because the authority of the church is in the scriptures, right? That's what strengthens the, the mother or father. That's what strengthens the office of a bishop because it, the authority lies in the scriptures, so we're all subject to him. That's why a bishop, according to the scriptures, is not allowed to run out and do whatever he wants to do. He doesn't have, he doesn't have absolute authority, right, to do whatever he wants. Right, right, except this new pope, I think he's going to, because he's a Jesuit, and I think he's going to morph this thing into, he's going to continue to change things, you know, uh, to bring in the bigger tent. So anyway, but you learned about Vigilantius, you'll learn about a few others here in the 5th century. Uh, next week, uh, Lord willing, and, and, and we'll look at some more of those people. And just, you're starting to see where all these heresies crept in and all these things, what changed? Because you look at the Bible and then you look at like Roman Catholicism, and you're like, how did that happen? This is how it happened. This is when it happened in history. You can start, you start to learn, oh, that's when that happened. Yep. That's when it happened. Okay. All right. So as far as the children go, 
Man, I gotta look at this now. You all, did I have you memorize anything in Genesis 2? I didn't, did I? It was just Genesis 1. Okay. Let's see. Seven through ten. Let's do seven through ten this week. Because our class is going to be on Genesis 2. So seven through ten. Okay. 